back, everyone. This is Chase, and joining me today is one more of our alumni from the OPDD program, Natalie Cullum, class of 2019, uh, a product designer at Orvis. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Of course. It's good to see you. Um, it's, it's been fun to check in with, with a couple of the alumni um, from the program to see how you're doing, especially in the crazy world that we live in right now. But uh, how are you doing? How are you holding up? <laughs> I'm good. Um, Vermont's a pretty awesome place to quarantine at. There's really nobody here anyways, so my lifestyle didn't change that right. much. <laughs> yeah. Um, besides not going into the office, but I'm good. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you're doing well, that you're safe. Um, I, oh. I imagine still some changes, I guess, with, with work, but um, yeah. maybe not so much in the, the number of people that you see on a day-to-day -day basis, <laughs> yeah. but... Um, but that's good that you're distant, that you can hopefully get out and fish and play a little bit too, right? Yeah, definitely. And I just got a dog, so we've been doing tons of hikes. I'm going to teach her how to spot fish for me. Um, but yes, fishing, hiking, climbing, all of the above here. Nice. That's awesome. I, you know, before we'll, we'll get into some of this, but when you were graduating, um, or before you started graduating, you were starting to talk to Orvis a little bit. Did Was Vermont ever on your radar? Did you ever think you'd live on the East Coast? No. Um, I knew I like fly fishing was definitely something that I wanted to get into. And I think that's why I was looking more towards Sims because it was in Montana. Mm -hmm. um, and never did I imagine moving to the East Coast. Um, but I'm honestly like happily surprised with how it is. Um, I thought it was mostly developed and it's actually super rural out here i'm in the green mountains um so i'm pretty happy besides being like 38 hours driving time away from my family uh it's pretty awesome here yeah 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 i was gonna ask you a little bit about that um you know i, w I wanted to cover a little bit like your experience transitioning from being in the program um to like working in the real world and what's that like yeah and, uh, yeah. I, I mean, when I went to school, I was in the business school and I rarely heard from alumni who could like give me an idea of like, what's it like? Like, what's it like when you actually get out there and you're actually doing the thing that everyone tells you, um, you know, you're preparing to go and do, which is get a real job. Um, right. And so it's, I think it's really helpful to, to hear like what that transition is like, especially if you're someone like yourself, where you go and you move 40 hours from your family. Um, yeah you know, to a small community, what, what's that like? What was, what was that transition like for you going from, you know, a program, you know, being in Utah yeah. to, you know, moving somewhere completely new? I think initially, um, there was a lot of nerves attached to the job. Um, just going there and Orvis is a very established company. Um, and the young people, are far and few between. Um, so just coming in at 22 and having kind of an important position because I'm the second designer that they've ever hired. Um, so it's kind of important for me to help push um, design and development in Orvis, especially in fly fishing and hunting. Um, so my first couple projects, I was very nervous. Second guessing everything, uh, not really sure if I was cut out to do it. Um, but once I started going through the motions and slowing down um, and understanding that like they get that I just came from school and that there's going to be that transition period there. And I really leaned on my mentors um, to kind of help me acclimate into the job atmosphere. I would had internships and I'd done stuff like that. Um, but really doing the every day eight to five um, was different. And also with designing, I feel like in school, we have the ability to be creative any time of the day. It's not really focused into this eight to five. So trying to transition from like, sometimes I'd work at 10 PM and get my projects done to like working in that allotted time. Um, so that was kind of a hard transition. Um, I've been at Orvis for a year now, 
So I finally can take a deep breath and be like, okay, I kind of know what I'm doing. Um, barely. I'm still learning a ton every day. Um, but yeah, initially it was those nerves and then starting to feel like I could take on more projects, but they were really nice on onboarding me pretty slow. They like gave me one big project and I had a couple months to go through the motions there and then I could start taking on more and more. And now I've kind of branched out of product design and development and working on sustainability and these like blue sky projects um, because I feel like I can wrap my head around those now. That's does that really answer cool. your question? <laughs> it totally does. Yeah. And, and it, um, it, it gives me a couple more questions that I wanted to ask. Yeah. From that. Um, like, I guess the day to day, maybe you can walk you through like what a day to day is like for you, especially where it seems like you're doing a lot of different things. And it sounds like the design team yeah. is really small and I've met some people yeah. from, from the design team and it seems like a great group. Um, what is, what does a day to day look like for you where you're going from design development to sounds like working on some other projects as well and sustainability. What does that look like? Yeah. So a day to day at the office, um, Typically, I, my job is to design and develop all of the products that I do. Um, so in our development schedule, we've got about three to four weeks for design, and that's it. So on those days that, um, in those four weeks that we do get to design those products, it's like hardcore, we're on our Cintiqs, headphones on, jamming out, trying to to pump out some sketches for our design review because it's such a short amount of time. Hopefully, um, we'll be able to get to a point where we have more time. Um, and then I work on a really close knit team. So we work in a pod um, and there's me, designer, the senior designer, Jim, our developer, Jesse, and then our sourcer, Simon. And we always just like come together in the middle. We're talking fabrics, construction. We want to align with each other. So everything, um, we're talking like design language if we're in the um, design portion or fabrics um, or whatever it might be. We're like super collaborative in that way. And then um, Sean Combs, our director, he also designs the rods and reels. So he'll come up in and bounce around ideas just because I think that that kind of stuff like really pushes progress. And since we're all working on different things, but it's within fly fishing, it should all speak the same language. Um, so I think that's really cool about like our setup there. And then like moving into the development on the day to day, it's a lot of emails with the factories, working with the sourcer Simon, um, picking out, materials we test all of our fabrics um so that's cool on getting that test data we have some testing machines down in our sample room um, for puncture and abrasion which is pretty cool getting to go down there or whether it's we want to prototype something quick um, we've got a sewing machine um, but a lot of collaboration, which is helpful for me, because especially in those like first couple months where I didn't really know what I was doing, being roped into that and just listening and seeing how they interacted with each other was really beneficial um, for me. And then uh, we sit right next to our planning and merchandising teams so we can pop over the wall and be like, how much do we want to sell this for? And like, what? can our costs be um, and how much are we willing to buy for minimums and that kind of stuff. So it's kind of what the day to day at Orvis looks like. It's a okay. lot of jokes, collaboration and grinding. Did anything prepare you for how collaborative it was <clears throat> going to be? Like I, it's hard to simulate that kind of an experience in a program. I know yeah. that you can have group projects, but I remember being a student and mm -hmm. like being in group projects and I just thought, this is terrible. I could just go do this by myself. Like, I don't want to work with, with these people because if there's some, for some reason you just know it, this isn't real. Right. Yeah. Like when you're working yeah. on a group project in, in class and sometimes it's easy to just blow it off and, or you get paired with someone who's not pulling their weight and you're just like, oh, I just want to crank this out on my own. <laughs> right. But in the, the real world, it's everything is like a group project. Um, 
and yeah. it's different from school because the people that you're working with are going to be very qualified and in most cases. Um, yeah. So I guess, I guess the question is like, how did you, and what was that transition like to being super collaborative, like collaborative every day, whereas maybe in the program, yeah, you collaborated, but a lot of your projects were more personal. Um, I personally really do like working in groups, um, and have quite a bit of patience for that. I don't think I really understood the value of the collaboration until probably four or five months in. I think at that point I was just like really trying to absorb information and then taking a step back and hindsighting like what I had gone through. Um, but I think in... I'm trying to remember the name of the classes and I'm forgetting them, but the aesthetics in brand image class with Andrea, um, we did a lot of, like it wasn't necessarily like group work, but you were presenting with like one or two people and we'd like play product line manager or merchandiser or the developer and like pitching your idea and kind of talking through it that way, I think actually was the thing that most prepared me for that. Of course, group work, working with other people. Um, but that like simulated that everybody's working on different things, but we have to work together in some way. It's not necessarily like my senior designer is also working on the design of my project, but in some way what I'm doing is going to affect him. So we need to be on the same page. Does that kind of answer? Totally. Yeah, it totally does. Yeah. Um, another thing that I feel like I've run into um, when talking to students and graduates is like, how do you balance being confident in your abilities? Like an understanding, I'm part of this really cool program and I've learned a set of yeah. skills that's really valuable and, and in some ways really unique. How do you balance that like confidence with uh like humility and understanding like you also don't know everything and you need to yeah. on your team like how do you but how do you you know make sure that you like stand up for yourself at the same time and and like know that you have value and and you bring that to the table does that make sense how do you balance those yeah. two two things so you don't swing you know to one extreme or the other Right. And that's something that I have really been processing lately. And I think that's a really important question. I personally struggle with confidence, especially within my team, because they've been there five, 10 years plus. Um, not that it matters, but they're all male and they're all very well established. Um, so just like coming into that environment was a little nerve wracking. So I did lack in confidence. Um, I'm now being able to find my voice, um, but talking about the balance of confidence and humility, I think um, it's really important to like understand your setting um, and understand like who's listening, who you're talking to, and just being really thoughtful with the way you give your ideas or your feedback or whatever it is. I think understanding like if you're presenting something I think it's awesome to have confidence um, in your design and really understand and show why you chose to do certain things I think that comes off really well but also like the ability to take feedback especially from a superior and maybe you don't entirely agree with it but you kind of just you have to work with them and talk through them. So that's kind of like the humility part of like, you're not always right. And there's going to be people there who have different opinions, which are most likely going to make it better because when people come together like that, that's going to help your product get better. Um, I'm trying to think, what was the second part of the question? Um, balancing. Yeah, just balancing Sorry. that that confidence and that humility, and and um, yeah. but also not letting yourself be steamrolled, right? If there's something that you right. like, understanding your value yeah. and recognizing that that uh, maybe you have a unique perspective or something that you can bring to the table. Right, right. So that's what I I really wanted to touch on that because that's what I've been really processing is like now that I've been there for a year um, and I've kind of like 
just been watching. I haven't really been interacting maybe as much as I should have and like finding the balance to where like my voice is going to be a benefit to the team. And it is like the differencing in perspective, just like being very thoughtful um, with what you're going to say is going to go a long way, I think. And not just like saying things to say things. If you're like in an environment where you're trying to find a voice and maybe don't have one, if you start to like say really thoughtful and constructive things, people are going to like start to notice you. Um, and that's kind of like what I'm dealing with now is um, feeling like I've learned a lot and feeling like I can add to the conversation and really wanting the things that I do get to say to be very clear and thoughtful and helpful. Um, so I get asked my opinion more. <laughs> but yeah, stay well, humble and hungry is what my boss always says. Well, I think that's great. I, I think so much of that, like... I imagine designers who switch industries probably this isn't unique to someone who's getting into their into their first real job. I imagine designers who are like transitioning into a different category or a different industry, like you need to take some time to just understand, like read the room and like yeah. learn what you don't know. Cause there's, you don't know what you don't know. Um, like there's a whole, probably a whole nother language material yeah. that maybe you haven't you're not familiar with there's like always something new that you're not familiar with because you haven't been in it day to day right. um yeah. and so i imagine that just kind of reading the room and understanding where you are within the process is is really important like you said um yeah I, yeah that's and i imagine a lot of it comes back to just reps like getting in that repetition right and like yeah. Um, I mean, you're only going to get better if you're surrounded, you know, if you're in that environment and you're soaking it in constantly and you, you know, you start up to pick up the, the unique language that the team uses or the industry uses, it seems like a lot of that only comes with time. Um, and yeah. you know, like even on the sketching side, right. It's like, you're only going to get better at sketching if you're doing it daily, or you're only going to pick yeah. up the, the unique parts of the industry if you're in it, you know, every day. So you know, how yeah. important is, is just putting in the work day to day and being surrounded by it. I just like getting comfortable with being in the industry. Like there's going to be a point where you don't know how to do things and you just have to yeah. eat and breathe it every day and you'll pick it up. Um, and the, you know, that's right. stuff that's hard to replicate in a class. Right. Yeah. Um, it definitely is practicing day to day. I think Another difference from like coming from college in a classroom setting into a work setting is that like personality management um, and that kind of communication. Um, so that I have, I luckily have like a really great mentor that I can kind of like talk with and ask like, why does this happen when I do that? And like really wanting to be a great person because we're coming into the industry with all of this design and development knowledge. Like we have that, we have the skills to do the job, but in a lot of cases, like your job is more than design and development. It's like making connections with people in the office. Um, like it, it's never a bad thing to be a good person or care about people or do that kind of stuff. Um, and not saying that I went into it not like that, but I think just I really understand the value of like Orvis is really cool where I am friends with one of the owners or I can walk in like the president knows who I am and like making those connections within the company goes a long way. Um, and I think that's kind of the stuff I practice on the day to day. Also, keeping my skills fresh. Um, I think I didn't sew for the first couple months. And when I tried sewing again, I was like a little nervous. Um, so that kind of stuff, I need to be better at keeping fresh. Um, sketching, we do most of our stuff in Illustrator. Again, it's just those four weeks. So I do need to be better at keeping those kinds of skills up. Um, but always learning, always finding shortcuts and stuff from my boss um, in terms of illustrator or whatever we might be working on. Um, and then like constantly like pushing your own process and like practicing, like stepping back and like 
looking at what worked, what didn't work, and how you can be better next time. I think that's something that I'm continually practicing. Um, Because when you show progress like that in a company and people notice that you're continually trying to be better and continually trying to push yourself harder, like that goes a long way. And those year and mid-year reviews and that kind of stuff gets noticed. Um, It's really going to help validate you being there at the company. I don't know. That was like a tangent. No, that was all, that was all great. I I think I agree. Like the skills are the things that like, it's going to, that's going to get you like an interview, right? If you have the skills, you know, if you have an impressive portfolio, I feel like the personality and the passion, the personality and the hunger are those two things that are going to get you the job. I don't know if that's yeah. entirely true, but I, I kind of feel like that's that's true and we're going to run with it. But yeah, but I, I think that's true, right? Because like when you're in an interview, right, those are the things that don't necessarily come across in a portfolio or in that resume, right? It's your passion for the industry, right. like your hunger or your personality. And, and like you said, like so much of a job is relationship based. And yeah. People, people want to work with people that are nice to be around, right? Um, yeah. yeah. You know, it's not like you have to be best friends with, with everyone that you work with. That's always nice. Um, it certainly yeah. makes like working a lot easier, right? When you like the people that you're, you're around, but it seems yeah. like there's a combination there, uh, there between like the technical skills that you need to make sure are really good, but also the intangible skills, right? Your ability to, to, yeah. you know, you know, build relationships or at, you know, I, I think you said it really well. So I love that. Um, Yeah. It's kind of like, I think Veronica really touched on like the creative and like pushing your skills, which I think is super important. But I also like, that is like the biggest thing. I don't know if I necessarily knew going into the job. Um, It's just that like personality and uh, interpersonal connections like really go a long way. Right. No, that's huge. And that's a hard one to, it's a hard yeah. one to know until you're in it, I imagine. Yeah. It's like, people yeah. can tell you that, but you don't really know what it's like to work in an office unless you're working, you know, until you're working in an office. Exactly. Um, you know, and, and that's why, you know, as much as a student, you know, if a student can get as much internship experience or like job yeah. shadow as much as possible, um, so you can can kind of simulate that experience earlier, I think all the better. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I'm curious with, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk too much about COVID. I know it's like the thing that we're all talking about and we're all figuring it out together, but I'm curious yeah. more from like a product perspective um, where you're re- working a lot remotely and you're sep- you know, separated from your team. Like what's that dynamic like? Um, and how does that influence how you design products and and the outcome like the types of products that are are developed when you're working separately right um yes it's been pretty hard just because like i touched on before we were such we were so close-knit and collaborative um i've definitely felt a little bit isolated i think everybody has um and trying to like still keep that momentum going has been really hard um, in the coronavirus times. I think we're all still executing what we need to execute. Um, Everybody takes turns and goes and grabs their samples from the office, um, whatever they need there. But it's also hard, like in our design reviews, people can't be touching fabrics, looking at it in their hands. and that kind of stuff or like seeing color not on a computer screen like what really is this color so we've really had to navigate how to best go about that and we're still really learning like we have ddr2 for spring 22 next week and we're trying to like pull together how everybody's going to see this before so they can really understand what we're talking about there because that's like the big group um with like VPs and merchandisers and PLM and everybody's in that room. And it's kind of hard to really get a feel of what's going on when you're not in the same room and touching product because our job is really hands-on. Um, so that has been pretty hard things we've done to 
kind of continue to keep that group dynamic is we've got lots of just like catch up meetings and anybody can talk about what they're working on, um, their to do lists, just kind of to like, it's just a good meeting to kind of like get everybody on the same page, whether or not your stuff really affects me, I'm here to listen. So it feels like more like an office environment while your kids are screaming in the background, like this connection here. Um, we can talk about your to do's or your goals or whatever that is. Um, and then I'll, obviously like talk through design and go through that kind of stuff. But those like little like happy hour meetings have actually gone a long way. Um, and then um, I'm trying to think we haven't done the best job. Like everybody's social distancing here pretty seriously. So we haven't done any like distant meetings really. Um, I think just like keeping that communication open and I think our nine to or eight to five has really gone from like 1030 to whenever or people are kind of being flexible. We got to feed the kids at 11. So we'll meet at this time. Um, so just keeping that flexibility there. But I think everybody really misses the office um, and that environment there so it's been hard if you have any suggestions let me know <laughs> i'm still figuring it out too sometimes i'll just go sit in my office alone just to be like oh yeah. okay this is this, this is what it's like, like to be you know in a work environment um yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll think about that and let you know um <laughs> you know along those lines i've i've asked this of you know a, a few different people who work in the industry and i've gotten some different answers i think people are still trying yeah. to figure it out but how do you feel like, well, from the consumer perspective, it seems like with COVID, obviously a lot of unemployment, a lot of people, you know, losing their jobs, money's tighter for a lot of people. I think yeah. people are, um, but on the flip side, you know, a lot of people want to go out and recreate more because that is a place that you can go and be socially distant. There's a lot of cabin fever. People want to get out um, and recreate. Um, but it seems like people want to buy better product and not just more product, you know, for, for yeah. economic reasons. Um, it seems like, um, how do you, do you see that from your perspective as, as a designer or is, are those conversations you're having around, do we really need to have multiple colorways of this thing? Do we need to trim down our product lines, or our assortments, just knowing that, you know, maybe we don't need to make more stuff. We just need to make better stuff because, the people that we're selling it to are more likely going to just buy one of these things and they're going to use it for a longer period of time than maybe they would have six months ago. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. Yes. That does make sense. Um, yes. Uh, we, in the beginning, we pared down our spring 21 and fall 21 launches quite a bit. Um, really asking the why question. Um, I think, um, starting with Jim, my boss, he's been there for four years now, um, being the first designer, real in-house designer, he started this like, why Orvis question? Um, and that's really easy to answer in, um, the technical part of the business that we do, which is fish and hunt. And it's just specifically for, um, those sports, but we have like lifestyle and those kinds of gear and apparel um which it's harder to answer that question like why do we need another button-up shirt does that kind of mm -hmm. stuff make sense um but within our department yes it was really looking at do we need how many colors do we need of this um just because from like a liability standpoint but we've been um lucky in that everybody wants to fly fish right now and we are doing better than we mm. ever have wow um so specifically in fish that wasn't as scary and we're actually being able to take a few more risks we're still really concerned with the virus and how long it's gonna last and when this good luck's gonna run out um but i think we're lucky in the fact that it hasn't really hit the fish segment of Orvis. Orvis as a whole isn't obviously is hurting a little bit, but fish is doing pretty well. 
Um, so that's helpful for me. I've gotten a few new projects. Um, but back to your question of like, yes, the why is very important. Um, and we have to really pitch our products to the teams. It's not just like, cause it's cute. Cause it looks cool. It's like for this, this, and this function. And if it doesn't answer those questions or those needs or that feedback we heard from consumers, it's not going through. There really needs to be a, why are we doing this? What's it and why is it important? And what is it going to solve for? Um, I think in school, you guys really told us that. And I, I listened and I did those kinds of things. Um, but again, it's not like real life. And I've learned how to story tell better. And like, since it is, um, everything is pretty distance, a lot of it's writing. So like when I give my why in the brief, it has to be really thoughtful um, and thought through so I can continue to make this product that I want to make. Um, and I like that people are Lipanese and maybe we don't need to make more. We just need to make things, a few things really well. And that like, I am really care about sustainability. And I think like that is where the entire industry needs to go. Like we need to make just a lot of, a few things really well. Um, and I think that's going to benefit us long term. Oh, I think that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I think just being more mm -hmm. intentional all, all around yeah. um, is going to be more important and really top of mind for people. And, and I'm glad you mentioned in the program, you know, I, I think sometimes you think I want to make this thing because I like it because I think it's cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then you quickly realize, well, maybe you're one of one and you're the only person who thinks that's cool. And <laughs> exactly. that, you know, yeah, you'll buy yeah. it, but uh, no one else will. Um, so yeah, and that's a hard thing to simulate, right? It's like, yeah, um, you know, that experience of, you know, or that urgency to like design stuff for other people because yeah. a lot of the time you're kind of manufacturing your own, um, you know, projects or you're thinking through like, oh, I want to make this thing for this situation or um you know i imagine in a company it just it's a lot easier to like keep on track and and be thinking about what is it that our customer wants um rather than yeah. what is it that i want so um that's really cool um i, I think I the more that students can like try to simulate that experience and and i try yeah. to tell students if you can go to a company and do like a day-long job shadow and ask them for a project that you can work on like you know, even if you yeah. do something like that, that'll start to get you in that mindset of thinking outside of just yourself and what you like. Yeah. And with Orvis, we have a really awesome field testing team just to like the importance of that kind of feedback, but also like being able to navigate that individual field tester might be the only one of their kind that likes that one thing. So being able to like absorb that, um, and really like make the best decision moving forward and not just like take everything they're saying. Um, Cause it's hard. It's hard to know whether it's just you or masses are going to like what that is. Um, totally. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then having to like trust your gut on certain things and trust the data. Like there's probably like a balance yeah. to that too. It's um, yeah. I'm sure you're, you're working through um, all the time, but yeah. Um, we, we talked a little bit about being flexible and like what you've learned about that. I think everyone is learning to be a little more flexible now. So I don't know if we need to talk too much about that. Um, yeah. but, um, you know, what, you know, the biggest shock, I think we talked a little bit about like, what was the biggest transition or the biggest, mm -hmm. um, biggest shock to you? Was it location? Was it like what you were working on day to day? I guess what was the biggest shock to your system when you got uh, this this first real job um it was not location i actually at first was not afraid of moving to vermont um I kind of just said yes to my dream job and went out there i think the biggest shock was i don't know if it was a shock but just like the pressure that I'm working at like a corporate company and they're going to buy thousands and thousands of what I'm designing mm. and it better be good. And I've never done something like this before where it matters this much. Right. Um, I think that was kind of 
the biggest shock but once you isolate that and just like really focus on the product um it's kind of like when you're climbing a mountain or yeah climbing a mountain you don't look down kind of thing um but I think that was definitely the biggest shock like I said I loved working in groups and learning from people and being patient and um hearing people's feedback and bettering myself as a designer it was just like all the pressure that like I got there and they gave me a project and they're like okay it needs to be done in this amount of time good luck yes they helped me along the way but it it felt like a big project right out the gates so I think that was kind of shocking it was it's probably helpful to know that like it's not ride or die on you though right like exactly. if you don't do the project well they're going to they're not going to just say okay we're going to make it and it's all <laughs> yeah. your fault right like the company's yeah. going to lose money you know it's like you know products are um the result of like a team working together right Absolutely. um so it's it's not like all that pressure is on you even though you know in the beginning you, there certainly is some pressure and some responsibility um but it's probably helpful to know that, well, this is a joint effort. It's not like you're designing in a vacuum and you know, your responsibility is to make something and the company's going to bet on it and spend a bunch of money. And, Absolutely. and if it fails, it's your yeah. fault. Um, so I, I, I imagine that's got to be an interesting transition to say the least, but. Yeah. I think that's important to note now that I know that I'm kind of out of that mindset. It's, I'm not afraid of that kind of stuff at all. And it's exciting. Um, I think it's great for people to know that there is, you don't feel that pressure. Like I think I gave myself an unnecessary amount of pressure um, and it's all going to work out and it's going to be fine. And there are going to be people there to help you. I don't want to take too much of your time. I got like one more question for you and you got to get back to the dog and to work. Um, <laughs> but is there anything that you wish you would have known? um in school like what are some of those things that you wish you would have had whether it's a a skill or you know learning more of those intangible things mm -hmm. um you know what is, is there anything that you wish you would have known or could have done hmm i think in uh, as far as skills go um Going into this, I wish I would have had more sketching experience. I think the sketch class um, kind of was created my senior year and my load was full up. So I wasn't able to take that. And I think that would have been very beneficial because um, my the senior designer is an amazing sketcher and I just look at him in awe and wish that I could do that kind of stuff. And now it's on me to learn and develop those skills, which is great um and i am doing um so in terms of skills that's kind of what i wish i would have been better at going into it um and then knowing the importance of the story and the why tying back into that um and like when we built out lines and say aesthetics or in studio um, i don't think i really understood like everything should be cohesive and everything should look well together and just like not thinking of every product as individual and thinking of them as a group and how they all work together. And I think that is really valuable to me because I like work on lines of things. Um, and I think there were teachers there that were telling us that kind of stuff and maybe I just didn't hear it as well. Um, but I think that's something really interesting, whether it's not like each product being cohesive, it's just being thoughtful on like why you're doing certain things and having reasoning behind them. Um, I think that is something that I've learned within this past year and I'm still trying to develop those skills of really looking at as a whole and really diving deep into why you're doing what you're doing and what is it for and what is it going to be used for um, in the end user? I think that's really important. That's great. I think those are really good yeah. lessons. Um, well, you know, I, I think I, I should mention this too, just before we kind of wrap up, but um, you know, I know 
we love telling your story um, and love, you know, your, you know, how you were proactive about trying to find, you know, a job in the industry by putting your work out there. Um, you know, for, for those who don't know, I mean, your, your, your story is one of those that we reference a lot because you, you know, designed a product, you made it, you know, you sketched it, you designed it digitally, you prototyped it, you tested it, you've got great pictures. You and Casey got some awesome pictures of you using the product. Um, and then you put it out there, which is, I think is one of those things that, you know, there's some fear that you have to get over. Um, yeah. like putting your stuff out into the wild, you know, on Instagram, um, or on your portfolio. And then, um, I, I, I imagine that's daunting to put it out there and just see what people say, right. You kind of are exposed at that point. Um, but yeah. by doing that, you know, that, that led you to this opportunity where, where, you know, people at Orvis saw your work, right. And, uh, that led yeah. to this opportunity. So, uh, you know, I think that's a key lesson that I love to share with people from, from your experience, right. Is just put your stuff out there, you know, don't, you know, get over that fear yeah. a little bit, be willing to put your stuff into the world because you don't know who's watching. Um, you know, and you also, you know, a lot of people undersell their value and what they can offer. Um, so yeah. put it out there is kind of the, the lesson that I love to share with people. Yeah. Absolutely. It's scary, but be proud of what you've done. And the program's not easy. And the stuff we make in it is pretty amazing. Um, especially we get to use all these awesome resources. So sharing that is very important and can really benefit your, your career. That's great. Well, we'll we'll leave it there. I appreciate you taking time. Um, you know, I, yeah. it's always good to catch up with you and hear how you're doing and and especially right now, it's I'm glad that you're doing well and and working and and um, yeah, it's, thanks for just being willing to share a little bit about your experience. Of course, you as well. It's good to hear how you're doing. I'm glad you set this up. Yeah, it's of good course. to see you. <laughs>